the, the program to get calls and viewpoints, which these CDs are coming out. Is there a website for that, too? It's right on the Middle East Institute website. And um, you'll see a little window that'll say publications. And then within that, there's something called viewpoints. We've done one on the next state, the post-Annapolis conference. We did one on that. Uh, that happened. We did one on the Pakistan uh, elections. We did one on uh, Israel at 60. We did one on... We did one on water issues, uh, water disputes. We did one on, I know we got a whole bunch. We'll, we'll do one next May on uh, state of the, uh, play on words, state of the art, state of the arts in the Middle East. Maybe it's my long day, but I still don't recognize the website. So it's yeah. Middle East what? Institute. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, oh, okay. Mideasti. Oh, oh, here, here, yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. The website's right on there, and I didn't even realize it until you mentioned it. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, we are up here. <laughs> happy hour. You know, you, for the last one, you got to have a happy hour. I mean, really. No, we should have provided it. Yeah. Oh, the email, your email? Super. Yeah, that's great. Please, John. Yeah, professor. Like, we'll, you know. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Peace and love. Dr. J. I wish. Yeah. Much better than your salary bracket. Uh, yeah. I teach in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Oh. And field trips are not out of the question to Washington, D.C. If I were to bring a bunch of students, would you speak to them a little bit? Oh, yeah, I love it. Uh, That's really to, cool. To, I can't pay you big bucks. No, no, I don't want any money. Um, Middle East Institute, ha Middle East Institute has a, a conference room about this size. We can sit about uh, 40 people in there. Yeah, I don't like to travel that either. Okay, yeah. So I mean, to me, actually, the smaller the better. But uh, the only problem is I teach on like full time on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. I'm with my students all the time, and then on Monday and t when school classes resume, and then on uh, but Monday and Tuesday I'm at the institute every day. So if we can, oh, basically, send me an email, and then we work out the date. Yeah, that'd be great. And maybe I can uh, snooker some unsuspecting former diplomat there, you know, to talk to them, too. Uh, I'll ask you a question that's been asked a couple of times today by some of our other guests. I'm ah. trying to get your perspective on it. Uh, we have elections coming up. Ah. Presidential yeah. election year. Yeah, next year sometime. Mm -hmm. And what type of... Uh, change do you think might take place with relations between uh, the Iraqi government, excuse me, Iranian government and the American government at that time, if any? Or six months later. Or six months later when the Iranians got their own in June. Yes. Right? Actually, I think that's the most interesting aspect. I mean, I'm always hopeful, but I'm always disappointed when it comes to this relation. I mean, we're, you know, we're talking 29 years here. Uh, I would say the best prospect would be, honestly, um, Partly because of expectations, people's expectations in Iran, from what I can gather, and but throughout the world, is that somehow if, if Mr. Obama is elected, that everything will change. Uh, as if merely being elected president changes like everything. Um, but I think that's so. Let's assume that there is an Obama presidency. Let's also assume that the accelerated, now we're learning through the grapevine, or not through the grapevine, that there is a sort of an accelerated or juiced up uh, transition process that's going on right now with both campaigns, uh, predicated on the common understanding that, like it or not, we're in a kind of a wartime mode, even though most Americans don't know that. Um, and therefore, we can't afford, like, you know, a year of painful, uh, confirmation processes, etc. So the second, so one is, what what's what's we need an Obama president. Why? Because it's related to the second thing. From what I can sense, there is a perception on the Iranian side that there would be more flexibility and fewer 
or no preconditions to establishing a dialogue as there would be with a McCain presidency. That may or may not be true, by the way. The third piece would be you would need this, this accelerated transition would actually have to take place. Uh, and, 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 and I'm skeptical there, you know, because every president that I've seen operate in this city, when it comes to a, a high value target like Iran or North Korea, begins with a comprehensive policy review. And the comprehensive policy review usually takes six to nine months to yield fruit. And when it yields fruit, it then goes to the principles. And then the principals discuss it and they bring it to the president. And it's a very cumbersome process. And what I fear is that if that's replicated in anybody's presidency here in Washington uh, with respect to Iran, that that's going to be doubly problematic because people's expectations with Obama coming in are going to be so unnaturally high. Everybody's going to want a piece of this man. Everybody's going to expect that he, that, that he is their answer to the neglect. You know, I take my students around. What I find is very interesting. Asians think their region has been neglected. Latin, Latin Americans think their region has been neglected. Everybody thinks they've been neglected. So, you know, you bring a new White House team in. And suddenly, everything's turned on its head. And all these people who say they were neglected now all expect to be priority number one. And that ain't going to happen. So that's the second, the third thing is the transition's got to go in a way that until now I haven't seen go. Uh, let's imagine that those things and maybe some other things go well, right? Better than expected. Then what might be really interesting is the kind of impact that might have within the Iranian political milieu. Because 2009 yeah. is also an election year right. in Iran. Right. And if there's some positive gestures from an Obama or a McCain White House that appear to have some traction politically in Washington and appear to be well received and supported as I'm sure they would be by European Union members and others, right? then what that might do is it could conceivably change the dynamic in Iran politically uh, and help, f help find a way to a non Ahmadinejad president who, if, since we're talking about hope, who hopefully would be, yeah, right, exactly. I mean, Right. So, that, so right. So, so the so the ideal thing is right is that you end up instead of getting mirror image gridlock, you get Obamaized. <laughs> Both here, you know, you get Obama's sort of counterpart in, in in Iran. It's not inconceivable, you know. I mean, that's I place my hope in that. But you know, hopes. Would they say hopes a thing with feathers or something? I don't know. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Some of which were fulfilled, some of which were not given the short term. Was alive, yeah, but yeah. Is that a place where our president can cut through the red tape you're referring to as to the review system and say, here is my, my this new mission, this new statement. Is that a feasible place where someone like an Obama, uh, maybe more than a McCain, might be willing to play that card on the order? It's a component, and I would argue that it's, an, it's a component that has been conveniently discounted by those who don't want to see an opening or, you know, I mean, but you could say this about it. Look, when the Axis of Evil speech was given, uh, then there was a view among some that, well, this rhetoric is overblown and people don't really pay that much attention to it, and that's absolute nonsense. I mean, these, these speeches are carefully crafted. Uh, they go through numerous sort of iterations. 
uh, there are domestic audiences and there are international audiences. And even if the primary audience is domestic, in a, in a globalized high-tech world, the, the, the message, even if it's not purposefully being sent to, to somebody outside the country, is being heard. And so uh, it can't hurt. It, it, it can't hurt to convey a, a, a positive, a message that is positive, that is flexible, um, and, and by doing so, it doesn't mean that you abandon the other tools of foreign policy because statesmen, statecraft, the same people who are saying, well, language doesn't matter, or, you know, are the people who talk about the toolbox of multiple instruments of statecraft. Well, that's one of them. And so if you use it, um, you don't lose the, uh, use it, don't lose the others, you know. We don't, by expressing goodwill, um, you, you know, you, you, I don't think we're going to be uh, abandoning our military tool. Or, so I, I think that would be useful. But I would also say, though, that the message as you described it, I would say is necessary but insufficient uh, uh, element to break the stalemate from our end. But to be honest, uh, there's a lot of things the Iranians are probably going to have to do. And, and they're going to have to come to some consensus on their side. You know, all the ingredients being all lined up on our side might still not result in reciprocation from the Iranian side or the kind of reciprocation we get might not be the kind of reciprocation we want. You know, they may say, yeah, we're perfectly happy to talk, <laughs> but we, uh, we're not going to stop enriching uranium. From your perspective, if we could develop something like just kind of like a grid, and we try to think of these as low priority targets uh, for this election, high priority targets, and now let's put them into three categories. Which are the ones that should be immediate? Uh, which are the ones should be short term? And which are the ones should be long term? In, in all of foreign policy? Yeah. It would be nice if the next president had the luxury of strategic choice, but he or she, or now he, doesn't. Uh, and, and so, like it or not, whoever inherits the White House is going to be left with a lot of unfinished business. And I don't know whether you want to put Iraq before Afghanistan or Afghanistan before Iraq, but, you know, particularly for those young men and women, and not so young men and women who are in uniform and who are going to be there for a considerable amount of time. Uh, so that really could become a high priority target, short term, immediate. Oh, there's no, I, I think there's no doubt about it. I, there's no way out of it. You, we can't, for example, it's, it's, it's inevitable. Okay. We, we can't, upon taking power, the next White House foreign policy team will not be in a position to set onto the back burner Afghanistan. Why? Because we are, we've been trying to um, uh, wrestle with all of our allies to make a m longer, more robust personnel and financial commitment to Afghanistan. And so if, if we were to signal that it was of lower priority to us, then the very multilateral structure that we consider, from our own point of view, to be necessary would, would crumble. On the Iraq front, I mean, you could already see the writing on the wall. I mean, you know, Senator Obama and his team are adjusting, you know, they, they're going this way, McCain and Obama. Obama's walking back from the 100-year commitment, which was probably just a sound bite, right? And Obama, from the, they're coming out, I'm going to consult with my military leaders. So they're walking back to the middle, and they're doing it for a couple of reasons, it seems to me. Number one, they are going to be ultimately competing for the same midsection undecided voters, right? So there's the electoral component. And second, because when they take office, one of them will, they're going to confront that reality. Now, it's an interesting question because then, it, if I'm right, and Iraq and Afghanistan are priorities number one and two, or one, two, right? Or one, one, one A, one B, then where does that put Iran? That brings us to a, a couple of 
sort of sidebar questions. One, can the U.S. government at the highest echelons with all the money that you pay them, and I do too, <laughs> right, can they walk and chew gum at the same time? Can they juggle these? In other words, can Iran, excuse me, nonetheless, sort of occupy a lot of attention and a high priority simultaneously with the others? Hmm. I don't know. B, right? Will the kind of personnel that the president assigns to deal with Iran, right, if he so chooses, be greeted and regarded with open arms as, oh, wow, this is, you know, President Obama or President McCain's right-hand man or woman, it's as good as having him in the room? Or are they going to feel like slighted? And therefore, is this just going to kind of simmer beneath the surface until such time or no time when the priority changes? And the C thing, that's the wild card. The wild card is poop happens. Things happen that you know. Look, 9-11 happened. Whether people should have predicted it or should not have predicted it, they didn't predict it. It became priority number one. Think of what happened when Bush took office first time, right? A lot of uh, anti-China rhetoric, blah, 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 in the campaign, but China was not an interesting place, different reappraisals, policy reviews on the way, suddenly American spy plane, right, uh, gets buzzed by a, uh, a Chinese fighter pilot, the plane goes down, lands in Hainan Island, and we've got, you know, 72 hours or whatever of really serious crisis. It becomes a priority. That happened to be one that happened and then was resolved peacefully in a relatively short period of time. But, you know, suppose, suppose there's another attack on the American homeland, you know, wherever it is. Suppose, I mean, there's, there are things you can't even imagine that could happen and that they may become the priority. Suppose there's a coup d'etat somewhere. You know, suppose, the, suppose in the Sudan, suppose the North-South agreement breaks down and civil war breaks out in Sudan, both North-South as well as the Darfur situation, like, and, 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 and all of the, and the groundswell of public opinion uh, makes it difficult for the administration to, to sort of concentrate on other things. So these are, this is a great question. Yes, sorry, one and two. So oh, I'll, I'll make my answers shorter so that. Okay. Um, I need Sabata to back me or to refute me on this. From what I know and people I talk with, I think that the majority of the Iranian community is really scared that McCain could possibly be president because they feel like he is so anti-Iran. Uh, there was a situation just less than a year ago where he was uh, meeting and greeting, um, typically for him, guys in, in some veterans administration. And uh, he was cracking jokes and, and probably didn't realize the press was paying attention to him. And he was singing a little song, you know. Bomb Iran. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And it, it, it just stays in the memory and, and a lot of Iranians um, I think it's tough to gauge how um, how how much a c comments like that uh, sort of permeate the consciousness of ordinary people and so, and what kind of staying power they have if they do. And even if they do, I think it's, the, you know, our tendency is to look through this through the lens of our own experience. Um, the Iranian governing establishment basically doesn't care about that. So in other words, I guess what I'm saying is, what, what, how is that perceived at the leadership level is really the interesting question. And I, and I just don't know um, how sophisticated the um, a, a knowledge is of the nuances of American politics, for example, is the fact that, that McCain is a card-carrying Republican and Bush is a card-carrying carry, Republican, does that lead people at the leadership level to infer automatically that they are more or less clones of one another? 
Or do people remember that, you know, McCain was more of a maverick a few years ago than he is now and that, you know, the Bush campaign did some nasty things to him? And, and are they aware of that? Are they aware of almost the need to say certain things and stake out certain positions in order to build constituency, you know? Uh, um, so I, you know, I, don't, I really don't know about that. I don't know how it plays uh, in Iran. But my sense from people I've talked to is, is that the, there is much more excitement and enthusiasm and expectation associated with the Obama campaign. Man, when I was in Europe, you would, it was, it was, it's amazing. It's just amazing. It reminds me of some of my friends who were so excited when Tony Blair was first elected, and they say, like, why, 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 does he, why can't he also be President of the United States? <laughs> you know, that wore off after a while, but, but you know, um, there is almost like a euphoria about how American foreign policy will change, and, and actually that worries me, because uh, it, it's... It's, it's hard to assign that kind of expectation and for anybody to be able to live up to it, especially when, yeah, I just living in this town, you know, there's this thing called, again, it's not a, a political concept, but inertia. It's a lot easier to enact some sanctions than it is to remove them. There is no constituency to remove sanctions on Iran, but there's a constituency to keep them on and to find more sanctions. Now, if Obama or anybody else had a love fest with the Iranian leadership, it would still be really hard to walk those sanctions back. And so, you know, it's, it's going to be a, it's a difficult ride ahead. And I don't know. Um, you know what we've been talking about, about the elections and, you know, trying to wait and see the outcome for the American and the Iranian elections. Um, and I just came to me thinking about all the Mm. Israel's response or lack of response or whatever. Um, in your mind, and you've talked about scenarios earlier, um, how difficult will it be, one, if Israel decides to attack in the next three months and keep them under control? And two, is there like a window, because I've heard that debated on CNN a lot in last couple days, is there a window of opportunity? Because as you know, they, they attacked Syria yes. and took out that nuclear Yes. Yeah, yeah. How do you think it'll realistically play out if it will happen? Okay, so this is m more about an Israel, a potential, is the, po the possibility of an Israeli strike. Yeah, without our knowledge. Without our, without our knowledge and or we without our explicit warned, approval. According to CNN and most we've already privately, through private channels, warned them that they don't have a go ahead for that. They, they're not going to get our unilateral support. Yeah. Um, and then they also have to take action based on their actions last time in Syria. Right. And okay. so I want you Yes. If that happens, how would we respond, and how would that respond? Wow, how would we respond? Wow, there's so many questions. That is yeah. great. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. No, 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 no. It's 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 a fabulous actually. I just want to try to keep my answer as short as possible. Okay. But these will be answers because those are a number of related questions. So so first is about the window, right? right? It's about the window. Right. Uh, I would. Number one is there are things that we don't know about 
the extent of the Iranian nuclear program. And so that built-in uncertainty, not only about ambitions, I mean, it's almost, it's very difficult to infer from capabilities what people may or may not do. And so for some, one school of thought is just look at the capabilities, right? Because you can't know. I don't know if I, if I agree with that entirely, but the point is we don't know a lot about their capabilities. And so it's very difficult to discern how large or how small the window is, exactly. right? Yeah. Because we have limited knowledge. Right. Now, I would say there's limited knowledge with big capital letters, and there's limited knowledge with little letters. The little, limited knowledge with big letters is what's in the public domain. We have much more limited knowledge of the capabilities of the Iranian nuclear program than the combination of intelligence agencies of the United States and its Israeli counterparts and its European counterparts. So there's a gap. It's hard for me to answer even that question because there's a gap of what I have access to and what they would permit me to see. Can't blame them, okay? So, but that's interesting because it has, it, it, because it, it dovetails with another aspect of this, which is, well, if you don't know, then like, isn't it better to act sooner rather than later? Because you may pass beyond the point of being able to do anything effective. This is the whole, this is the whole notion behind the Bush Doctrine, right? And, and behind the difference between preemptive action and preventive action. Yeah, uh, Lynn Cheney was, or, or one of the Cheney was saying something about, well, all the options are on the table. You know, and, and it's like, well, yeah, but the options are all uh, gathered around that. And I mean, it, I can intellectually understand that argument, but as again, as an emotional person that's worried about right. my brother and his family, it bothers me because, I mean, it, in my mind, Well, it could conceivably, but, it, but we, I think we could reasonably assess that a larger conflict is way down the timeline. And the reason for that is that not only is the longest range missile, it, and even if, it, well, not only is the longest range, miss, range missile barely able to hit the eastern fringes of Europe, not the continental United States, but it's doubtful how many of them that there are that are operable. And on top of that, it's a, a, it's, it's a degree of technical wizardry that we don't think the Iranians have, are, are within range of mastering to be able to take a nuclear, to be able to create a nuclear warhead and marry it with the missile right, yeah, right. without so having the like, missile just go up and down. Yes. Worry about the reaction. That's the, the in the most words when we start breaking down the history of wars and how they got started. Yes. Not so much how things initially got started. The reactions after. I uh, so. Okay. So so then let me cut to the chase. I, I think that the likelihood of an Israeli strike, or for that matter, a United States strike on Iranian nuclear facilities, any time in the coming weeks and months, is is highly, is very low. And the reasons from the Israeli side is not that they don't have the capability, but that it would be a stretch to, to make that kind of a strike. The, the Syrian strike and, and an Iranian strike are quantum leaps apart in terms of the degree, not only distance, but degree of sophistication. Syria had, to the best of our knowledge, one facility above ground. The Iranians, the, the Iranians have at least 26 separate sites, some of them, if not most of them, hardened and beneath ground. Um, the U.S. Air Force could debatably damage, if not destroy, all those that are known. But, but here, yeah, but, but. But, but here's, the qu here's the question, even if the U.S. did it, right, would be, could, could they destroy them? And, and if they destroyed them, right, forget about a p potential types of retaliation. 
Let's think logically. Would this cow the Iranians and cause them to abandon their program? No. Some would argue that even if you destroyed all the hardware, you can't conceivably destroy the software. And so what it would do would be it would set the program back. So the big question for those who are you know, pumping up the military option, whether it's the Israeli military option or whether it's the US military option, are in a way deceiving you. Because essentially what they are saying, without actually saying it is, we can't destroy their nuclear program. All we can do is buy time. And when you do it that way, right, then you really have two options. You can either buy time through some carrot and stick diplomacy, or you can buy time through a military strike. Now, buying time through carrot and stick diplomacy is time consuming, there are no guarantees, it's politically difficult to sustain and to market without being humiliated by your opponents, okay? Um, military strike has not only political costs, but it has, you know, potential economic and military costs. And this is where your brother and his friends come in. Right, you know. but what's the, I mean, that again, you know, what, is it, what, what, what are we going to do? Right? I mean, reasonably, given all that analysis, what's the bottom line? What's the best option? There is no best option. I mean, that's what I've learned in foreign policy. That's, that's what is, that, you know, my students come in asking, do they like, you know, it's like they got out of algebra. They'll come in and they'll say, so what's the answer? There is no answer. That's the answer. And, right. Yeah, me too. Yeah. No, no. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, there's least worst options on, in a lot of these things. So the question is, what do you think is the least worst, worst option? I, I think that the military option at this juncture is probably the worst worst option, particularly if it's Israel. Why? Because Israel may possess the capability to damage, if not destroy, all these complexes, right? But they can't bring down the Iranian regime doing it. And whether they consulted the United States or not, or whether they got the United States government to basically shake hands and say, you guys do it, fine, you have our full encouragement, the United States would be held responsible for it anyway. And my view is, if you're going to be held responsible for it anyway, then you might as well do it yourself. <laughs> you, you know? Yes. If you see one. Oh, there, there, I mean, there has been, you know, since uh, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, uh, which, whose birth uh, occurred during the early stages of the successful Iranian Revolution, uh, was given right of passage through Syria uh, to establish headquarters and training bases in the Bekaa Valley in Lebanon in the early 1980s. Uh, I mean, I, you know, some things are probably disputable. I think, I, I don't know one serious person who disputes the sort of the origin or pedigree of, of Hezbollah, or, or the, the, the original sort of connectivity between the Iranian Revolutionary Security Services, if you want to call them that, and, and Hezbollah, okay? But the questions, the, but there are questions, I think, doubts, debates uh, about the degree of operational control that any individual or any institution in Tehran has over Hezbollah today. Hezbollah today is a very, very, very multi-dimensional, sophisticated operation. They have a television station, they have a radio, they have a campaign staff, they participate in Lebanese elections. They have parliamentarians. More important than all of that is that they were the standard bear bearers for two things that created a powerful, passionate, sort of loyal following. And 
apart from the issue of religion. One is that by anybody's headcount, the larger, the plurality of people in Lebanon in the early 1980s were Shiite Muslims living in slums and destitute in southern Lebanon and marginalized. Marginalized politically, marginalized socially, marginalized economically. Trampled upon by Palestinians who used Lebanon as guerrilla staging bases against Israel. By Israel which retaliated with attacks against Palestinians, but after all, who was living in between, right? So, so, she, so number one is you've got Hezbollah that has a sort of grassroots, very deeply connected to the Shia population, A, because of the poverty, destitution, and marginalization, a, a sort of populist cause that Hezbollah manipulated, exploited, no question. Related to that is that the Lebanese government either never had the ability, or I would argue, never had the will to take care of these people, to, to provide them with daycare centers, to provide them with just the most rudimentary medical care. Hezbollah did that, just like Hamas did that in Gaza. And by, pro by creating this kind of grassroots social network that empowered people or that cared for people, there was a kind of a reciprocal loyalty, gratitude to them. The second reason why it had become powerful is that Israel found that it had no choice. I mean, maybe it had a choice, but the strategic choice it made on two occasions, in 1978 and in 1982, was the biggie, was to invade Lebanon, to cleanse Lebanon of the Palestinian guerrilla fighters once and for all. And they stayed. Well, they stayed in Lebanon. You know, I mean, you could argue about where Palestine is in the but and where Israel begins and ends, but internationally recognized borders. There is a border of Lebanon, and Israel occupied Lebanon. To some people, Hezbollah was like heroes because they fought against Israeli occupation, and and Israel, for its own purposes, at a particular time, made the strategic decision to withdraw. And there were a lot of good reasons why they did. Domestic reasons, domestic political reasons in particular. And so when I give you all this background, I don't do it to bore you completely to tears, but just to say that, put a timeline in your head of two points. 1981-82, which one, when Hezbollah appears on the scene, and Iran, in a way, is its master. It's, it's, it crea helps create it. And the year 2008, a lot has happened on the ground. And Hezbollah has acquired an identity, a multidimensionality that it never had, and maybe that its own leaders never contemplated in 1981 and 1982. And as a result of that, I have serious questions about how much day-to-day -day operational control uh, the people in Tehran have over Hezbollah. Um, they send them money for sure, big cash. It ain't coming from you know legal businesses or even some of their illegal legal businesses only. The Iranians subsidize Hezbollah. I think there's like no question about that. There's a financial pipeline for sure. And the arms are clearly are coming from Syria, or and or through Syria from Iran. No question about that. But in terms of decision making, operational decision making, there I'm not so sure. Uh, and then on the question of like what military operations do they launch, then it seems to me Hezbollah also has morphed over the years. You know, in the early days it seemed like all they were doing was sort of committing acts of terrorism by sort of anybody's definition, really. You know, nowadays, uh, it, it, I don't know what you want to call them, sort of hybrid activities, and, and a bunch of different activities. Some military and within that some, you know, conventional military. We have time for one more question. Um, you mentioned, um, or, or was mentioned, uh, is Iran, uh, whether or not they want to be a country or a cause. And I'm, I'm thinking of when you talk about a scenario, looking ahead, um, how do you see uh, the whole region uh, moving towards some kind of um, 
normalcy um, or towards a cause because to me the nuclear thing is kind of in some ways to me it's out of our control like we mm -hmm. can't take them out then but um, the other question of whether or not uh, you know we're going to be involved trying to stem a cause or uh, whether things are going to sort of settle down or in the future in what direction might that be as a whole yeah, you know, I'm just not sure. Um, within the political milieu in Iran, as I understand it, at, at the highest levels, I, I think that there is contestation there. I think that there are some who we call, for lack of a better term, pragmatists, and who see Iran as being a state, a country first and foremost, and who want to sort of subordinate sort of ideology or what we might call ideological extremism and militancy to the requirements of Iran's sort of survival and progress as a sort of a, you know, a, a, a sort of a natural political and economic like entity, a country. I don't think that's fully resolved though in Iran. I think, in a way, I had hoped that it was moving in the direction toward pragmatism, but, you know, this guy Ahmadinejad, at least for me, seemed to come out of nowhere. Uh, even, you know, a lot of people, including a lot of Iranian analysts, I think, underestimated him. He speaks to a sort of raw nerve of sort of populism, and, you know, uh, s some of the things he says resonate with quite a few people. Um, it's tough to figure out um, how that might um, how that might directly impact the character and conduct of Iranian foreign policy. To be honest, you know, just as I guess like the United States, you know, all policy is politics, all politics is local. So too, I think, in in, in its own way, this is true of Iran. The next year or so is going to be very interesting. I don't see the regime collapsing. You know, the, the oil, the SUVs, <laughs> you know, the, the oil situation has cushioned Iran against sanctions, even if we were to have a straitjacket of effective sanctions, which multilateral, which we don't. And, it's, and, and ironically and sadly, it's cushioned Iran against the complete ineptness and misguided economic policies, if, if there are any policies, of the Ahmadinejad government and his forerunners. But I mean, this guy is clearly the worst, and even his own parliamentarians and people from within his own circle publicly have indicated they're a little bit concerned about it. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it's amazing, but you know, the, pri the, price at the, the price at the pump is keeping the Iranian political machine, like, to mix, you know, well, well oil. And this contest is going on, and I don't really see, I, I, I'm, my, my hopeful scenario is that we have a non Ahmadinejad who is pragmatic not only in his relationship with the United States, but pragmatic in terms of relations with his neighbors. Um, that's one, one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is to say, you know, Iran may be the least of our worries because Iran is a Shia country and Iran by and large if you look at its history is not an expansionist power in the last couple of centuries and Iran and, and what we really have to worry about is Sunni radicalism uh, and Al-Qaeda is really not, in it, not the handiwork of Iran um, no, and, and so, so, so there's, there's, there's that I guess um, who, who is? Well, I mean, to the best of my knowledge, if you're looking at sectarian identity, Al Qaeda is Sunni, not not Shia. In Iran. Oh, your friends, your friends, the Saudis. Well, I mean, everybody wants to, you know, everybody. It's it's easy to blame. You know, and to say, well, the Saudis created it, and then to narrow that down and say, like, the House of Saud and the royal family and these particular members. But I mean, there's no question that S Saudi money helped helped 
Osama bin Laden himself was a Saudi. Uh, 15 or 16 members of the, the team that knocked off the 9-11 attacks, right. But I mean, that's also very simplistic because uh, uh, where are the training bases these days? They're inside Pakistan. Of the attacks that were conducted in Europe, when they went back and they profiled these people, it was very hard to come up with like a template to identify, you know, sort of like these five characteristics. But the, a vast majority of them happened to have had a recent trip to Pakistan. So, um, you know, I mean, I think you could probably say, if you wanted to boil it down, uh, the tinderboxes for recruits and ideologues were Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Pakistan. And they converged on Afghanistan because it was a convenient nesting place. It was a broken state, uh, which by its very nature uh, became a con you know, a, 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 an ungoverned space, which they could use and did use. Yeah. And of course, that's what the border area in Pakistan is an ungoverned space. I want to thank Dr. Calabrese. I just have one quick announcement. We're heading to the theater, so if there's time for a quick bathroom break or if you need to run up to your room, or if Dr. Calabrese has time to answer a little bit more of your questions, but otherwise we're meeting in the lobby in 10 minutes to head over. Unfortunately, the speaker might be there earlier, so I wanted to get everyone over there. And with traffic, getting over on the bus during rush hour is... Yes, we're going on the bus. Okay. Thank you so much. That was really profound. Thank you. And I wish you the very best. Oh, yeah. You'll need it. All right. You'll need it, too. I definitely need it. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. That was great. I guess the lights are there. You must be fun in the classroom. I think. He comes from the best school. Uh, when they said American University, I thought of the American University in Beirut, and I thought, oh, that's